Happy Mother's Day. It's a good day to be in church. I'm Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. If we've not had a chance to meet, I would love to say hi to you after the service. I also want to thank Pastor Doug for the opportunity and the dangerous mission he has in allowing me to be up here (laughs) to preach so often. So uh, with that said, we have been in the midst of this Trailblazer series where we have been looking at the tabernacle. Um, And it's occurred to me as we've been looking at this tabernacle series uh, that there's something we may miss about the tabernacle, not just about the tabernacle itself, but about the people to whom it was in their midst. The generation that were freed from slavery in Egypt, the generation who saw the Red Sea part, who walked along dry ground, who saw their enemies drown behind them, the generation who were told they were going to go into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and God's provision and protection. These people who had the tabernacle with them, God's presence with them, they didn't make it. That generation didn't make it into the promised land. In fact, as you read the New Testament especially, there's conversations often about the fact that they failed. They didn't make it into the promised land. And so, It becomes a warning for us and a cautionary tale of how can people who have been freed from slavery, rescued from the hands of their enemies, experience new life and a new chapter and have all of that waiting for them and God's presence with them and still not fully live into it. How does that happen? I think it's because they were overwhelmed by the wrong things. And so today, I want us to wrestle with how to be overwhelmed. Uh, now, many of you are probably saying to yourself, Ryan, I do not need to be overwhelmed any more than I already am. <laughs> I uh, currently have my master's degree in being overwhelmed, working on my doctorate, as a matter of fact. I'm doing just fine. But It's also not lost on me that we have moms in the room who are literally thinking, I could preach this sermon. Like, (laughs) I could preach this sermon every day for the next 20 years. Like, it's all good. Uh, In fact, there's a New York Times article uh, that just saw just the other day uh, that says, new report confirms most working parents are burnt out. (laughs) Really? (laughs) We get it. That's that's not a big surprise. I'm not sure it needed a New York Times article uh, for it. It's kind of a duh. Uh, But if you take some time and just do recent stats and just kind of look at issues amongst our generation and things that our world is dealing with, anxiety, stress, fatigue, not just mental fatigue, physical fatigue, emotional fatigue, nurses know full well compassion fatigue, and something new that I'd never heard before called feed fatigue. Now, feed fatigue is not what I would say most people in my position understand, uh, where you go out to eat and you pass off from how much food you have eaten. Uh, that's not feed fatigue. Feed fatigue is the fatigue you experience when you have been looking at your phone and on your social media feed and you have been bombarded with so much information, so much brokenness, so much stuff in the world, it becomes exhausting. And you couple that with all the things you have going on in your everyday life, and we are a very exhausted people. But this passage today, and the topic we're going to talk about, I hope is going to help us enter into a conversation about how to be overwhelmed the right way. So let's enter into the story in Exodus chapter 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day was lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. Now, Moses leads them through the wilderness, and they end up uh, at a certain section where they are going to send spies over into 
uh, the promised land to check it out and bring back a report. And the report comes back that, hey, promised land is everything God said it was going to be. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's all good, but there are enemies over there, and there are obstacles, and there are issues, and there are giants. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. And Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the Lord we passed through and explored, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased, if the Lord is pleased, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. At that point, the Lord is frustrated. He's going to wipe them all out. Moses does what Moses always does. He intercedes, and the Lord says, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will see the land I promised an oath to their ancestors. No one has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because of my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. I think we have something in all of us that tells us that it's okay to be overwhelmed by some things. I've had plenty of conversations with many of you over lunch and conversations in my years as a pastor with people who, when they start talking about their family or their kids or their church family or the things God has done in their life, they get overwhelmed. I can literally think of lunches we've had where I've seen tears in your eyes and you're like, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cry. But it's good because there is a good overwhelming feeling we should have. Sometimes it's the gravity of a situation and a moment that overwhelms us or a place that we enter into. Remember my wife and I went to the 9-11 Memorial and Museum a few years ago and if you have a bucket list, that would be something you should check off as. I, I would encourage each of you to go to the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. And while we were there, something interesting happened. Um, you can just kind of walk around and do what you normally would do, or you can get a pair of headsets and be a part of a tour group who will take you through and walk you through all the different things. And so my wife and I did that. We got the headsets, and we could hear the person up front, and they were giving us all this information. And it was interesting, but at a certain point, about five minutes in, I just took the headphones off. I couldn't handle it anymore. And I couldn't handle it because I was getting all this information about stuff and being led over here for five minutes, and then over here, and over here, and over here, and I was getting overwhelmed with information. When I took the headphones off, and I just walked around, and I just saw what was there, the fact that thousands of people died literally in that spot. It's built around basically a, a cemetery. The power of that place, the presence of that place overwhelmed me, and I did not need all the information. I just needed to be present in its midst. There's also a deeper kind of overwhelmed that we can get and that we need to experience. We're made to experience the overwhelming presence, power, and purpose of God in and through our lives. This is what the Israelites had firsthand experience in. 
God's presence is something that we find all throughout Scripture, this desire to be with his people. By the time we are in this particular chapter of Exodus 40, uh, the story has happened, the story picks up, and God has rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. He has called them to be his special possession, his representatives on earth. And then at Mount Sinai, they have this conversation with God through Moses, and then Moses back to God and then back to the people. It's like the amazing race of BC. Moses is going up the mountain, down the mountain, up the mountain, down the mountain, being an interpreter and being a conversationalist between God and the people. But then this really interesting moment happens in Exodus 20. It says this, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. God wants to be present with his people. The last time God has been present with his people in this way was back in the Garden of Eden, right? He's present with his people there, his creation. He's there in in the midst of creation with Adam and Eve, and there's a closeness there. But then sin enters into the story. And there's this brokenness that happens. But this is the next time where God's presence is going to be with his people, not in the midst of perfection, but in the midst of a broken, sinful world. And not only in the midst of that, but actually leading them and guiding the people of God. This is an amazing truth that God's presence is not afraid of brokenness. God's presence is not walking away from it, but God's presence is right in the midst of all the crazy that we experience every single day. In fact, when Jesus showed up, the writer of the Gospel of John says this, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. The word for dwelling there actually means to tabernacle with his people, to be with his people. And then Eugene Peterson translates that. I love this. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. God wants to be with us. The issue is, do we, like the Israelites, stand at a distance? And we can't really blame them for standing at a distance if we're going to be like truly honest, right? Like, it's powerful. With God's presence comes his power. And that's not something to be taken lightly. There's thunder and lightning, and it's not a vacation at Mount Sinai, right? Like, like they're there, there's a lot of things going on that seem way too powerful for them, and they are standing at a distance, sometimes for seemingly good reason. So God's presence is both terrifying, but also causes transformation. God's presence is feared, but also inspires faithfulness. See, I think um, some of you are reading uh, an Exodus book commentary by Dennis Prager, and he says this, a combination of love and fear is a model of how people should strive to relate to God. I think that's 100% true, because sometimes I feel like we've kind of domesticated God. We've made him easy to handle. We've made him easy to kind of understand and very palatable and very just kind of easy. But the problem is, if God is powerful but not able to be in relationship, then nothing ever really changes. There's no love and no real transformation. But if God is all relationship and no power, then no transformation happens. You have to have both. There is this overwhelming presence and power that God has, but it is approachable. It is something we have been invited into to experience, but we will be transformed by it. In fact, if you think about it, the most powerful things in your life that have transformed you have been a little scary. If you really think about it, the experiences that have helped you grow the most have been pretty scary. And I think at times we try to make Jesus a little too safe as well. We make Jesus kind of this easygoing dude who's just kind of doing his thing and loving on people. When in actuality, Jesus too had his moments. There's a moment where the disciples are with Jesus and they're all in a boat and there's a big storm happening 
and uh, they're freaked out, and they look over, and Jesus is right there with them, battling the storm. No, he's asleep. He's asleep in the boat, and they're like, you going to save us? Wake up. And Jesus got up, and he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Then John pulled out a guitar, and they sang Kumbaya. It was all good. No. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. If you don't think God is that powerful, then there's no way you'll be able to surrender your life and experience his actual power in your life. So something interesting happens. We have the presence of God that then brings the power of God, and that leads us into the purposes of God. That gives us the confidence to step out and to have faith and to take these faith steps, not because of our own ability or our own abilities, but because God is powerful and present, and that changes things. And I can live into the purposes he has for me, especially when it's scary and hard. And so we see this story of these Israelites with the tabernacle. They leave Sinai, they go to the wilderness, and they go, and they're at the edge, and they see the promised land. They send the spies in, they come back, and they say, it's everything God promised. Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit of what God has done. It's right there. But there are obstacles. There are giants, and there are enemies, and there are things that we feel like we can be overwhelmed by. Notice, though, they are overwhelmed not just by the obstacles ahead of them, but they are overwhelmed by the slavery they said they had left behind. Their gut reaction is not just to fear what's ahead of them and what they need to step into by faith, but what slavery they've come from in the past. They are overwhelmed by both their past and their future. And it's in this moment that, again, I think we can't really judge them too harshly because I, I think we find ourselves in the same spot sometimes. Sometimes it's easier to go back to the things that you know, even if what you know is to be a slave. Because you understand it. You get it. There's overwhelming things that we encounter every day in our lives that, if we're honest, we can break certain routines, but we don't because we understand it. Because we get it. There's certain habits we can stop. But sometimes we're overwhelmed by the familiarity of it and the routine. When God has called us to something more. Not only that, but we can miss out on the promises that God has and the purposes he has for our lives because the obstacles seem too big. What overwhelming great thing are you allowing to stop you but you haven't just given to God and let him overwhelm himself. But look, there's Caleb and there's Joshua who are telling them, listen, God's power is enough. What we will see when we walk into the promised land, we can devour it. I think we all need Caleb's and Joshua's in our life. We need people in our lives who step in and say, you can overcome this issue. You can step into this purpose that God has for your life. They don't just let us coast by, but they challenge us. These are not happy conversations with people. Often they're not always just the best. Sometimes it can be a little bit much, but we need people in our lives who help us step into those purposes God has for us. And not just that, but sometimes we need to be that for somebody else. I have a lot of great friends. There are friends who I love deeply, who are good people, people with a moral compass, and they love God. But there are also friends that I have who I need in my life because they are inspiring. They challenge me. Their faith and how they live pushes me to the next point. It helps me say I need to take next steps. I want to be that for people. I want to help people step into that. But honestly, it takes a certain kind of courage because we live in a world that's incredibly cynical and that just wants you to remain where you are and not take next steps. That's not the life God has called us to. So there's something that also happens here with the Israelites that I think is uh, probably the most amazing part of the story. 
you would think that God's presence being with them and then being told that they're not going to enter into the promised land, the natural thing is, well, they just packed up their bags and they went back to Egypt and just kind of had the rest of their life. But they didn't. They kept on. They kept moving forward. This generation was told, you're not getting to see what we freed you for. They kept moving. They would set up the tabernacle. They set it back down. They set it back up. They set it back down. And they moved forward. Despite their failures, God's overwhelming goodness followed them and went with them anyway. There are experiences that all of us have where we get tripped up and we feel like we failed or we haven't done enough or we have missed the boat major. God never stops being with his people. He never stops. And I think about the fact that they not only experienced this kind of life and they, they kept moving, they kept going regardless of their own failures, not just for themselves, but for their kids. Because their next generation would be allowed into the promised land. I mean, Moses didn't even make it. Imagine the witness of being a kid and seeing your parents, knowing that they're not going to make it to where you're going to make it, but they keep moving anyway. Because there's some overwhelming sense that this might still be God's purpose for us, to be an example to the kids and to help them into the next phase. I think about my own mom on days like today. And... Um, my mom didn't have a, an easy life growing up. She was a middle child, which many middle children in the room can go, amen, it ain't easy. And uh, she married very young, moved away from her family and friends, and went all the way to Florida, which some of you would think is a vacation. Um, as one who's been there, it's not. Lots of cockroaches and gators and stuff. Moved to Florida when she was young. And uh, she had cancer, which the um, type of cancer she had caused her not to be able to have her own biological children, which is why I'm adopted. Um, she put herself through nursing school when I was really young. She was also foster parenting, uh, a tough situation as well with my foster brother. And uh, she didn't have an easy marriage. It ended in betrayal and divorce. And so, in being a single mom, uh, she had a really immature, bratty teenage son <laughs> to raise on her own. And uh, she's bought a house, we moved into the house, and it's a fixer-upper. She's never really had to do any of that, and so she'd be out there working on pumps and working on these sort of things and just moving through, just doing what she had to do. And as I think about my life, and I think about how much she sacrificed and did for me and for our family, I get overwhelmed because I know that every step along the way, she made it abundantly clear, no matter how overwhelmingly painful the situation she was in, no matter how much betrayal she had experienced or hurt or loneliness or trying to figure life out, she never let that overwhelm her any more than God's overwhelming presence and goodness in her life. She never let it. I never saw it. What I saw was a woman who would be pushed to the brink at times. But she would never stop praising. She would never stop praying. She would never stop being there for me and for the call that she felt she had on her life. And that was a gift. It was a gift that I hope I can leave to my own children and they can leave to theirs and to theirs and to theirs and to theirs. You're going to go through, and many of you already have, gone through so many overwhelming things. But there's a right overwhelmed. Let God be the overwhelming God that he's made to be in your eyes. Walk in the overwhelming presence and power and purpose that he has for you. When you are tempted to think that this is all that there is and that I can't do it anymore, God has already made a way. 
So my prayer for you is that you are overwhelmed by who God is and what he's doing in and through your life more than anything else. I love you, church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the overwhelming presence and power that you have in our lives. Lord, we are indeed tempted to be overwhelmed by every little thing that happens, by all the stuff. But God, just as you were in the tabernacle and with your people everywhere, you are with us everywhere. Your presence and your power helps lead the way. It makes a way in areas that we could not make a way for ourselves. Help us to surrender and to step into that. If not for ourselves, then for those that are watching us, our kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, the next generation watching and asking, is this all real? We'll thank you for the opportunity we have to experience all the things that you are with us for. Amen. Thank you.